Good morning, everyone. Before we formally begin, we wish to inform our audience of the following house rules for the smooth conduct of this online activity. We wish to request everyone to kindly mute your microphone if you're not speaking to avoid unwanted noise and feedback. A question and answer portion will commence after the panel discussion, and all questions and comments shall be directed to the Q&A box for those in the meeting room and to those uh, watching us via our, our, live, uh, our Facebook live stream, we would like to ask everyone to please direct your questions via the comment section. Please make sure to state your name and organization before your question or comment. We shall gather the questions to be read by the moderator during the panel discussion as well. And for everyone's information, this webinar is being recorded and streamed via our official Facebook channel, UNDP Philippines. Thank you very much, and we look forward to everyone's cooperation. Welcome, everyone, to the launch of the 2020 Human Development Report in the Philippines. We are honored and grateful that you have taken the time to join us this morning. My name is Charlene Balaan of UNDP Philippines, and I am your host for our program. COVID-19 has indeed exposed the deep flaws in our societies taking root wherever it has landed and exacerbating inequalities everywhere. But unless we relax our grip on nature, it will not be the last crisis we face. And as people and the planet enter an entirely new geologic age, the Anthropocene or the age of humans, it is time for all of us to redesign paths for human progress by fully accounting for the dangerous pressures we put on the planet. The 2020 Human Development Report entitled The Next Frontier, Human Development and the Anthropocene introduces an experimental new lens to its annual Human Development Index. This is the 30th anniversary of the Human Development Report, and so it is a timely refresh to the human development concept and metrics for a new geologic age. To contribute, It also showcases why we can contribute to addressing the interconnected challenges of our time. So what is new? This is, this is not another sustainability report. It goes beyond needs, beyond sustaining, beyond summarizing well-known policy options. Our aim is to focus on how we can collectively expand human development in balance with the planet. To formally open this morning's program, we will all hear from the resident representative of the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines, Dr. Selva Ramachandran. Dr. Ramachandran, a Malaysian national, is a seasoned development practitioner. Prior to his appointment to UNDP Philippines, he served as UNDP resident representative and country director of UNDP Sudan, UNDP country director in Libya, chief of Northeast Asia and Mekong Division, Re regional bureau of UNDP Asia in the Pacific, New York, and UNDP country director in Yemen. Esteemed guests, allow me to turn over the floor to Dr. Selva Ramachandran. Over to you, Dr. Selva. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cha. Uh, let me start by belated Happy New Year wishes and welcome you to the launch of uh, the 2020 uh, Human Development Report. I'm very proud that you are with us today. I'm also delighted to acknowledge the presence of uh, white stakeholders, stakeholders in the webinar today, right from government officials, ambassadors, and colleagues from the embassy, our civil society partners, academia, the private sector representatives, my fellow colleagues from the UN agencies, and the general public. Upfront, my thanks to the panelists who will be facilitating and stirring the discussion. Once again, welcome and thank you all for being with us today. Dear colleagues, in 2020, in a span of few months, we witnessed the world drastically transition, a transition to a new normal prompted by a pandemic that had, that had zoonotic origins transmitted from animals to humans. As we began the new year, while we welcome the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine in many countries, we are yet to abate the spread of COVID-19 virus fully. In fact, the virus continues to threaten our lives livelihoods and our decade-long development. The outbreak of this virus is not sudden. Scientists have long predicted the inevitability of pandemic like COVID-19 for years because of ever greater pressure 
we humans put on nature. The virus was rather another proof that shows how human life hangs in balance with nature and the planet. This is the Anthropocene, or the age of humans the 2020 Human Development Report sets out to discuss. The report under the theme of the next frontier, Human Development and Anthropocene was launched globally on 15th December 2020 in the presence of Prime Minister of Sweden. We are gathered today to launch the report and discuss its implications in the Philippines. Societies, including here in Philippines, are facing COVID-19, climate change, inequality, the triple interconnected challenges. The report underscores that the poorest countries in the world could experience up to 100 more days of extreme weather a year by 2100. Similarly, vulnerability to disasters from storms to famine linked to natural assets will be rampant in those countries where inequalities are already the highest. This fact resonates with us, with most of us here in the Philippines, as Philippines is one of the countries that is facing multiple climate change related hazards. In fact, the projections are such that 30 years from now in 2050, we most likely witness cities in the Philippines submerged in water due to coastal flooding as an effect of climate change, according to a Climate Central report released in 2019. This shows that a greater part of our development is at risk of being wiped out by one of the most drastic effects of global warming. Similarly, inequalities in income and opportunities such as access to quality education, health and technology are ravaging our social fabric, thereby weakening social contracts and reducing the potential for inclusive development. To illustrate this situation, 2020 Human Development Report introduced a new lens to its annual Human Development Index by adjusting the HDI, which measures a nation's health, education, and standard of living to include two more elements a country's carbon dioxide emissions and its material footprint. With the resulting planetary pressure adjusted PHDI, I mean, what I mean is with the resulting planetary pressure adjusted HDI, we call it the PHDI, a new global picture emerges. No country in the world has achieved the magic, magic combination of high development and low planetary pressure yet and more than 50 countries dropped out of the very high human development group, while only few countries moved upwards, reflecting the dependence on fossil fuels and material footprint. In the case of Philippines, the country losses HDI value by 2.4% from 0 .1, 0 0.71 to 0 0.7 in 2019. This means countries have a significant strides to make to achieve human development that doesn't cost the earth. This is the next frontier human development. We have an extraordinary opportunity as we recover from the pandemic to stop the unsustainable development and set a new transformation path, a path that fully accounts for the dangerous pressure humans put on the planet and dismantle the gross imbal imbalance of power and opportunity. UNDP hopes that 2020 Human Development Report will instill national conversation around these issues. As we launch the 2020 Human Development Report, allow me to share three important insights from the report that could inform our actions. First, if we all are convinced that it is possible to advance human development without putting planetary pressure, then the question is, what can we do? The answer boils down to appropriate incentives, social norms, and nature-based solution that will re reset how people and planet interact. Second, human development in the Anthropocene will require whole of society responses. Given the interconnected nature of the problems we are dealing with, we must aim at systemic change, staying away from pushing a few policy levers to tackle discrete problems. I hereby call upon the governments to provide the leadership that helps everyone 
from individuals to civil society to the private sector to navigate this new age. Third, we need to develop new metrics to measure human development. As we enter the new era, we need to enhance our measurements for human development. For example, we need to enhance, for example, by introducing the experimental THDI together with the HDI, we could assess and more importantly, encourage choices that towards a human development journey in the Anthropocene that moves us all in direction of advancing human development while easing planetary pressures. Similar kind of measures should be developed based on availability of data to inform both public and private sector decisions. In conclusion, I would like to say many interesting insights have emerged from the Human Development Report, which will be shared with you in the subsequent presentation. I believe they will shed important lights for our discussion. UNDP is committed to work with you all as Philippines chart new transformational path towards human development that doesn't cost the earth. We are committed to support, to define and operationalize a national development plan underpinned by green development thinking. Working together with the government, we hope we have developed digital tools that will assist the national government as well as local government units to monitor recovery. We also have set up a data lab called Pintic Lab to deepen our analysis using both traditional and non-traditional data. The effort to far-reaching digitalization can be explored further. We can make COVID-19 recovery as the opportunity to address the historical inadequacies in caring for the planet and therefore chart a new course towards a more favorable PHDI. Thank you again for being us with us. We invite you to engage in discussions and act individually and collectively starting from today. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you so much, Dr. Salva. And as Dr. Ramachandran stated, human development in this new age will require whole of society responses. And that is why we have gathered representatives from across different sectors for an in-depth discussion on how we can build back better, given the interconnected nature of the problems we are dealing with. Today, we are also honored to be supported by the Philippines' premier socioeconomic planning body, the National Economic and Development Authority, one of UNDP's most steadfast pa partners in development. Here we have the Honorable Acting Secretary Carl Chua to deliver an opening message to launch this landmark report. Let us all listen to his message. UNDP Resident Representative Dr. Selva Ramachandran, our partners from UNDP, colleagues in NEDA and in the government, our development partners, and stakeholders a pleasant morning. We congratulate UNDP for the launch of the 2020 Human Development Report. Thank you for rec recognizing the significant human capital gains we have all worked on. The report also tackles crucial issues on natural disasters and sustainable development and emphasizes how our actions shape our planet and affect inequalities in society. We value the report's endorsement of empowering people to enhance equity, foster innovation, and instill a sense of stewardship of nature as these are all consistent with our development objectives. All of these will help us with insights on the future directions of our country and our people as we rebuild resiliently and head into the new and better normal with hope and optimism. 2020 was a trying time for the world, and the Philippines was not an exception. We started the previous year in a very strong position. In 2018, we have already lifted 6 million Filipinos out of poverty, or four years ahead of our 2022 target. We were also on track to becoming an upper-middle income country in 2020 prior to COVID. Our Human Development Index has also steadily increased and we have already joined the category of high-level HDI. Moreover, we have established the Subcommittee on Sustainable Development Goals under the Development Budget Coordination Committee of the NEDA Board, 
This would help us systematically empower Filipinos in achieving their aspirations while relaxing pressures on the planet. However, several natural disasters and COVID-19 pandemic halted our human development momentum and disrupted our economic growth trajectory. Despite having one of the longest lockdown periods, we were able to prevent widespread infection and improve our health system capacity. These actions potentially saved tens of thousands of lives. But these wins were not without trade-offs. 75% of the economy and even our society was effectively shut down at the height of the quarantine. This caused significant losses to jobs, livelihood, opportunities, and businesses. It also disrupted education and limited social interactions between individuals, families, and communities. Fortunately, the economic, social, and institutional reforms that the government had previously undertaken helped the government mobilize resources quickly and caution the blow of the pandemic, especially to the most vulnerable population. Moreover, we saw that with an improved health system capacity and with people's cooperation in adhering to the minimum public health and safety standards, we have been able to safely open the economy. With this, we have seen positive economic development as early as the third quarter of 2020. We recorded a smaller GDP contraction of 11.5% compared to 16.9% contraction in the second quarter or an 8% quarter-on-quarter growth. Labor market indicators also showed significant improvements as economic activities gradually and safely resumed. But this is not enough. This year, our focus is to carefully manage risk and address our public health needs while putting in place policies and programs that will spur economic activities. This is so we can care more for the people who have lost their jobs or who have no income sources. We need to ensure that they will have the means to meet the basic needs of their families, to protect their physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and to build capa capabilities, rather, for realizing their potentials. Keeping these in mind, the directive now and for the next two years is a whole-of-nation approach to focus on our recovery and achieve a healthy and resilient Philippines. Together, we will chart a path towards a change that enables a strong economy while ensuring ecological integrity and social development. As implied in the 2020 HDR, Filipinos' participation on such initiatives can only be expected if they have the required opportunities and capabilities. Therefore, it is important that we continually pursue inclusive health care, education, and social protection programs that will empower individuals and communities. We will soon be sharing with you the updated Philippine Development Plan for 2017 to 2022, which will show our priorities for the next two years, including enhancing the implementation of the Universal Health Care Act, improving the quality of instruction in education, upscaling the workforce, and institutionalizing the social protection floor. The plan will also include other reforms and strategies we will undertake to meet the Sustainable Development Goals and help every Filipino achieve the long-term vision of Matatag Maginhawa at Panatag na Buhay by 2040. Again, congratulations on the launch of the 2020 Human Development Report. May we all stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Chua. We are truly grateful to NEDA for the partnership and the support. Before we even begin to unpack the findings of the report, we want to address the question that most of our audience have. What is the Anthropocene? Here we have a short clip to help us understand what it means and how it should shape the way we design our pathways for development. Anthropocene. 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 Giorgio, help me. Do I have to pronounce it correctly? Some of this is something medical. Something to do with old. Uh, I think that's to do with climate change. So something to do with people. Anthro means man, right? Or human, man. 
I don't know the meaning of that word. Oh, the Anthropocene. Yes, I know what that word means. Can I get a hint? The current geological age viewed as the period during which human activity has been dominant influence on climate and environment. I think it means that the environment and it's been damaged. Oh, we're in the Anthropocene. Current geological age, I should have known that. <laughs> Man, that's such a good word for right now. To present and unpack the insights and findings of the 2020 Human Development Report and its implications to the country, I will now turn over the floor to Ms. Yemi Werke, the Senior Policy Advisor of UNDP Philippines. Ms. Yemi heads the Impact Advisory Team, which is responsible for policy research, partnerships, and pipeline development, and which also houses the Accelerator Lab and Pintig Lab of UNDP Philippines. Prior to this, she worked as economics advisor in UNDP Uganda, Rwanda, and Gambia, and served as a senior policy officer in the Strategic and Policy Directorate of the African Development Bank in Tunisia. Turning over the floor to you, Ms. Yemi. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I'm Yemstra Chasefa, a senior policy uh, advisor for UNDP. Uh, Again, let me say welcome to the launch of the Human Development Report uh, uh, 2020. Uh, I'm here to share with you uh, the uh, key messages of the Human Development Report, uh, which uh, uh, some of it has been reiterated by our resident representative uh, earlier on. I'll, I will try to be as much as possible brief. Now, in my presentation, I will cover it in two parts. One would be covering the theme of the report, and the second one that I will try and share with you today the human development uh, trends uh, in Philippines by just illustrating a couple of uh, um, uh, human development indices uh, that we regularly produce in UNDP. Now, without any further ado, let me go uh, to, to uh, the very point that has been shared a little bit earlier with you in the video. There we are, we now learned how to pronounce Anthropocene. It means the age of human. Let me say that uh, we in UNDP has dedicated the 2020 report to the Anthropocene and uh, human development in the recognition and the reckoning of uh, the unprecedented moment that uh, the human uh, kind is living through and the planet as well, uh, in which uh, where uh, red lights have been flashed. Uh, we would like to say that uh, this is because of uh, human action, uh, our dependency in particular on fossil fuel uh, and uh, a human consumption uh, of material consumption in the manner in which uh, we live, produce uh, and share. That has led to um, a huge um, impact in terms of climate change, uh, biodiversity collapse, uh, ocean acidifications, water and air pollutions, just to mention few of them, uh, this is destabilizing the very uh, planet that we depend on and we live and survive on. That is uh, unprecedented in scale and uh, uh, speed. Uh, um, so it is in this uh, uh, um, particular uh, situation that we are sharing with you uh, that uh, uh, the, in 2020, uh, uh, we have gone through a number of uh, uh, situations, uh, uh, including uh, um, a hurricane uh, in many countries, uh, whereby uh, um, a, a extraordinary um, uh, uh, record-breaking hurricanes have been happening. Uh, we've been uh, going through extraordinary fire uh, that has been reaching uh, in Australia, Brazil, uh, Pantal, Pan, uh, Pan, Eastern, Eastern Siberia, Russia, and West Coast in USA, 
Again, uh, even in Philippines here, we've been uh, um, uh, visited by several typhoons that has been frequenting us uh, and devastating uh, lives and the livelihoods uh, of many. Uh, the, the, the planet also has been uh, uh, witnessing uh, close to 70% of our wildlife uh, being lost since 1970 uh, in, um, in a, a record high uh, time. Uh, of course, uh, I cannot not mention COVID-19, which has been affecting the whole of the globe, sparing no nation, which I think we all are going through. It is a, a very uh, difficult and challenging moment whereby we are, we are coming to, uh, to a, a recognition that uh, we're putting significant pressure uh, in our planet uh, that is uh, leading humans for the first time in the, uh, in the geological epoch that we are shaping the planet, then the planet is shaping us. Uh, now, uh, as we move on, uh, as we talk about COVID-19, I would like to reiterate a couple of points here. Uh, um, of course, uh, it's a glimpse of what is uh, coming. Uh, um, scientists have been long predicting that a pandemic like this one will be uh, um, uh, happening, uh, and there it is, it affected us uh, in 2020. Um, it, it, is a, uh, uh, it is a disease that certainly has uh, jumped from a wildlife to human beings simply because of the pressure that we are putting in that is squeezing the ecosystem and increasing the intensity and the frequency of human interaction with wildlife. So it is in this uh, uh, that uh, we uh, have looked into how it has impacted uh, human development. Uh, I would like to concur with the points that has been made by uh, um, NEDA secretary uh, that it affected every corner of our lives and livelihoods, all aspects of human development. In fact, in this report, we assert that we are estimating it has caused a reversal um, of human development progress uh, across the globe in unprecedented fashion. In fact, it has affected us close to six years of um, progress has been reversed due to a uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, in the case of Philippines, the work that we would be sharing very soon with you, we work with PIPS, we are estimating that five years of uh, human development progress might have been uh, reversed uh, as a result of um, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the effect of human uh, the, the COVID-19, nine out of 10 children have been out of school as a result of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the disruptions um, in, uh, in uh, uh, COVID-19. Now, as I, I move on to the next um, uh, point, uh, you would recognize that, uh, you would recognize, next slide, please. Uh, you would recognize that uh, um, uh, as countries develop over the course of time, the, in this graph whereby the bubbles are representing the countries and as countries progress in human development, uh, uh, you would see that uh, their footprint on the planet has been increasing over time. The higher the country's uh, progress is in human development, the higher their footprint by way of carbon dioxide emission or even the material consumption that uh, uh, it has been. It is in this sense that we are saying there is a strong correlation uh, between human development progress and the uh, uh, resource use, and there is a need for decoupling um, between growth as well as uh, um, uh, uh, from material use and carbon dioxide emission. Of course, some countries in OECD, even in Asia, are attempting to decouple growth from that of uh, uh, material use and uh, carbon dioxide emission in a related terms, of course, not in absolute terms, but uh, the progress that has been made so far is uh, not yet adequate. And these incremental change that we are introducing since the last couple of decades are not yet giving us the desired result and not even causing us, uh, giving us uh, 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 the necessary um, reduction in the planetary pressure. Next slide, please. 
Uh, now, uh, as we discuss the planetary pressure that humans are causing uh, in, the, uh, in the planet, uh, which are dangerous, that can engender many risks, uh, which can materialize by way of uh, um, uh, uh, shocks, uh, I would like to say that uh, these uh, planetary pressure uh, are interfacing and interacting with social imbalances that are happening in our society. Uh, when we talked about social imbalances, I would like to specifically mention that inequalities are getting higher and rising over time, which were documented in our 2019 report, which is very rich in, uh, in uh, really putting out uh, the, the incidence of inequality. You would notice that even if we, we take the case of uh, COVID, um, and, uh, while COVID has happened across the globe and all of us are affected, it is not the intensity and the manner in which it affected our lives are actually very different for many of us. Uh, if you look at women, uh, workers in the informal economy, uh, small and medium enterprises are significantly impacted negatively than many of us who have an opportunity to continue to be working and earning our salaries. If you look at children in the cities as compared to in rural areas, uh, many, uh, nine out of 10, as I mentioned earlier on, across the globe are out of school at the moment, missing out close to two years of their education uh, um, uh, learning outcomes uh, uh, due to the digital divide uh, that prevails uh, in many countries. So when planetary pressure interfaces with social imbalances, it re reinforces um, these, uh, these uh, risks and shocks and putting in further pressure on the planet to which we rely on for our survival. To this extent that we believe that this vicious cycle that I'm demonstrating here to you need to be broken uh, uh, if we were to make progress uh, in uh, human development going forward. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the 2020 report, which uh, uh, all of you will have the privilege uh, to, to read and indulge into, uh, has uh, um, offered us rich amount of insights as to what it means uh, to, be, um, to be making progress in human development in the age of humans, in the age of Anthropocene, in the Anthropocene. And there you will have multiple um, uh, uh, opportunities to look into these very challenges that I have been uh, demonstrating earlier on. The report doesn't stop by just providing evidence. In fact, it offers us uh, uh, mechanisms and principles that could guide our actions, uh, which has been touched upon by our resident representative earlier on, which I would also illustrate in a little bit. And it also explores a new experimental matrix for the new age, which I will also share in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. Now, uh, in terms of the mechanisms for change, the report has identified three very important uh, uh, areas for us to discuss today. The first and most important one being the social norms and values. As documented in the report, in fact, many people appreciate the pressure that humans are putting in in the planet. Close to 80% of them believe that we need to take action on uh, addressing these pressures. Uh, however, only 50% of the humans are actually taking any action as such, meaning there is a disconnect between the values and the action. It is within this that uh, the report uh, highlights uh, there is a need to look into our social norms. And then uh, uh, with COVID, we've learned that human beings adapt fairly quickly to new social norms, and uh, you could uh, you could um, recall in what uh, ways we have actually changed uh, our behaviors, uh, including in wearing uh, um, a mask, uh, uh, as uh, as we have seen it in the last couple of months. So it is important that we revisit our social norms to be able to put uh, in everyone's day-to-day uh, um, uh, -day actions 
uh, uh, the, 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 the changing the behaviors. The next and most important thing that the report has looked at is the incentives and regulations. Our incentives and regulations actually affect the decisions that we have been making and the investments uh, and the resource allocation of many of us, including at a, as an individual level, business level and government level. So it is very important that we look into climate finance, which is affecting the manner in which uh, finances uh, are spent. Uh, in a, in, instead of investing hugely on uh, fossil fuel, for example, we could start guiding the finances to go more towards renewable energy, which would then save the planet uh, um, in uh, multiple ways and enrich our human development. Of course, we should start working with prices reflecting the true cost of producing goods and services by reflecting the cost on social as well as the cost on the environment, which has been missing in the past. So uh, this way, uh, in, including in the carbon uh, prices that has been uh, uh, guiding the carbon market, we should be able to reflect the true prices uh, to help uh, um, uh, change uh, uh, this course. Uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, practical measures that uh, we uh, as collectively can take, the report has provided enormous amount of information about nature-based solutions uh, that can be implemented uh, by all of us. In that regard, that I would like to recognize that the work that Philippines has done in Apollo I large uh, uh, with a community restoration measures that has been taking place, huge amount of uh, uh, recovery has been happening, uh, restorations have been happening in our marine life, which the report acknowledges that uh, how small actions can actually lead to greater results. Uh, the, there are several measures that the report has uh, shared, including afforestation, uh, forest management, improved agriculture, and so on and so forth, uh, that can help uh, in uh, reducing the pressure on the planet while we are advancing uh, human progress. In doing so, actually, the report also offers some key principles that we can be guided. These include, of course, a stewardship towards the environment, uh, the very um, uh, um, uh, environment that our lives depend on, uh, and equity considerations, uh, and then innovations to push new frontiers for human development. These are very important principles we need to embed as we move forward in the Anthropocene for human development. Uh, next slide, please. Let me now move on to uh, the, uh, uh, the new era needing a new uh, matrix for measuring. Uh, uh, it's not the first time that UNDP has introduced uh, uh, new measures during the course of the last 13 years. Uh, it didn't take a pandemic for us to adjust the planetary um, pressure to be embedded into our human development index. But uh, this is one important experimental measure that we have introduced this year, uh, uh, whereby we wanted to really demonstrate the, the effect of uh, uh, human action on human development. And you would see on the left hand side of the slide uh, that we have plotted uh, uh, the index of uh, planetary pressure, which uh, combines carbon dioxide emission and uh, material consumption per uh, uh, capita basis in tons. Um, and uh, developed an index. It shows that over time, our, the, there was an increase uh, in planetary pressure uh, as uh, uh, we, uh, we humans progress. In the middle, you will see that we plotted the human development index against that of the planetary pressure adjusted human development index. And then um, we draw a 45 line to just show that if these two indices are close to each other, meaning closer to the 45 uh, uh, degree line, uh, that um, there is very little pressure on the planet that countries are posing, and the dotted lines represent each countries. Uh, of course, you would see that the ones in the uh, orange and uh, yellow uh, are um, countries who are in the low human development and medium human development category. Their effect on the planet actually has been very limited uh, uh, as, they, uh, as we could uh, demonstrate here. But countries that are in green are countries who are high, uh, very high human development category, uh, making huge pressure, as you could see, 
from the distance between the Human Development Index and that of the Planetary Adjusted Human Development Index. The most interesting um, one for me is the, the graph uh, on the right corner, whereby we plotted Human Development Index against the index of uh, planetary pressure. You would see that the area which is marked in uh, green uh, that, sh uh, that shows the sweet corner where high human development is being achieved at a very low um, planetary pressure. No single country yet has achieved that particular uh, uh, point, which shows that that is the new frontier for human development in the Anthropocene. That is what we invite all countries to look into and re-engineer their development pathways. Of course, as the earlier demonstrated by our resident representative, you would note that not many countries actually have achieved that, but even those who were in the very high human development category, out of 60, 50 of them dropped out, indicating that uh, they were making progress at the cost of the planet. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of really concluding the thematic part of this presentation, let me say one important thing to, to all of us here today. We need a new path, a new development discourse in the next decades if we were to reverse the condition that we are in today. And that takes a whole of us. So within that uh, uh, perspective that we look up to governments of many of uh, the member countries in the UN to provide the necessary leadership for this new era and the new pathway for human development. And certainly after 13 years since 1990, when we introduced the Human Development Index and the concept of human development, it is remaining the, as a most important concept that can guide our pathways going forward. It is the focus on capability and agency, human agency, that would make us uh, break this uh, vicious cycle we are in. It is not systems that will change systems, it is human action that will help us to change uh, the systems. With that, I would like to conclude the first part of the presentation and move into the next uh, part of the presentation, which is sharing the progress uh, of human development in Philippines. Next slide, please. Next slide. Let me start by the Human Development Index, which is the most famous one, but this is not the only index that is presented in the report. So I would invite you to look at all other measures that have been shared in the report. You would see that Philippines, as Secretary Chua has said, has been making progress in the, in the right direction, reaching the high human development category. As of 2019, it is ranked as 107 out of 189 countries. Sharing that particular status with two other countries, namely Bolivia and Indonesia. In fact, the two countries have started from a lower base and catched up with Philippines. But uh, uh, if we look at the left side of this uh, graph, you would see that uh, progress has been uh, initially very steady, uh, continued to be steady, but uh, at a rate uh, which is lower uh, than the, um, the East Asian average, as well as the high human uh, development category. And then if you compare it with other countries on the right side, uh, from Asia, you would note that uh, countries like Korea, uh, Hong Kong, um, Japan are, also, uh, are uh, really making huge progress in human development with, uh, uh, with a, a very high category, whereas uh, 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 Pakistan, for example, uh, is uh, lower compared to uh, all others uh, in this uh, particular graph. Next slide. If we look at the details of the Human Development Index, you would note that we have three categories, one focusing on access to knowledge, which we measure on education. We have a, a, um, a health, uh, which we measure using life expectancy. And the last one, which looks into standard of living. In the case of Philippines, you would see that all the three components of human development would be making progress over time. Uh, however, uh, you would note that uh, uh, the one in education has been having uh, um, a slight oscillations over time, yet all the three, there is enough room for improvement uh, for if the Philippines is to move from high human development category towards uh, very high human development category, which is uh, the next frontier challenge that we have been talking about. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, uh, uh, if we look at uh, uh, the Human Development Index, as you note in previous uh, uh, Human Development Reports, we've been discounting the Human Development Index by uh, inequalities that are prevailing in each country along the three dimensions of human development uh, that we've been talking about. To the extent uh, uh, the adjusted uh, Human Development Index for inequality, uh, if you look uh, on the right side here, for Philippines, over time, Philippines continues to lose a significant amount of its human uh, development value. Uh, uh, and in the case of 2019, we lost close to 18.2% of our human development index value due to inequalities that are prevailing in the country. If we compare the situation with other Asian countries, you would note that uh, the loss that Philippines uh, is uh, um, facing uh, is uh, slightly higher than the East Asia and Pacific average because there is six percent while the uh, Philippines is losing 18.2%. Uh, uh, other countries are also equally losing because many of the Asian countries have a high prevailing inequality in, uh, uh, as they progress. Next slide, please. Now, uh, talking about inequality, let me try and talk about gender uh, equality, uh, which we usually document through our gender development index. The gender development index, which uh, is a ratio of male human development index against the, that of female, indicates uh, 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 to us that Philippines, as a matter of fact, uh, is one of the few very uh, relatively equal countries uh, in the group one category because the female human development index is uh, much higher than, uh, slightly higher than that of the, the, the male human development index. This is unique in that sense. Um, uh, if we compare it uh, in Asian countries, you would note that Thailand and Vietnam actually mirrors that of the, the Philippines uh, trend, whereas uh, other countries uh, are slightly uh, lower in their gender development index. This, however, should not be overinterpreted to mean that there is a gender equality uh, in an uh, absolute way in Philippines. In fact, there are gender inequalities in Philippines uh, if we look at additional uh, indicators. Next slide, please. Let me now go to uh, the, the, the new uh, index that we are delighted uh, to share this year, which is the Planetary Adjusted uh, Human Development Index and uh, how Philippines is faring in that. You would see that uh, uh, when we compare the Human Development Index, which we regularly uh, publish uh, together with that of the Planetary Adjusted Human Development Index, we lose close to 2.4% of our human development uh, uh, um, index value. Uh, compared to that of the East Asia in the Pacific average, which is 9.5, we lose slightly lower. Uh, and then if you also compare it with other East Asian countries, uh, the Philippines loss is uh, significantly lower uh, from that of Korea. Singapore, which are the, in the very high human development category, who are losing close to 18.6% and 30% uh, um, uh, within the range of that. So this means that uh, uh, so far, the, the, the discourse that Philippines has fo followed has not resulted into significant pressure. Although there is some pressure, not significant pressure on the planet, and we should not be complacent. In fact, we should continue in that pathway uh, to balance the planet and uh, uh, the human development progress. That's all what it says. But I would like to say that this is not the only index that the Human Development Report shares on the human development in the Anthropocene. In fact, we have developed a new dashboard which looks into 21 indicators over four different categories that you could look into and compare and uh, uh, look into the trends across the globe in the region and specifically in Philippines that I invite you all to look into beyond this particular uh, index, which is an experimental index uh, that can give a wide ranging uh, uh, indications as to where we are in, in, uh, in that. Uh, with, uh, with that, next slide, please. I would like to conclude by uh, calling for uh, action as we build back, uh, as we build forward better. Uh, really, it is important to recognize that we've made progress on human development. 
uh, over time, but be because as we see in the COVID era, our gains are very fragile. Uh, so Philippines need to continue to make progress while addressing inequality and maintaining a low pressure on the planet. That is the key conclusions that I would like to draw upon. Uh, in terms of UNDP offer, our resident representative has already reiterated our offers to you today. We wish to share with you that we have expertise and tools, uh, including the Pintig Lab, the Data Analysis Lab, that is uh, uh, that its services are made available to all stakeholders to reimagine the future of human development in the Anthropocene. Uh, we are also very much happy to say that we have integrated programs and financial support that we, we are more than happy to offer, which go beyond a quick fix um, uh, uh, towards a greener uh, and more equitable development. And in that respect, that I would like to also share with you that we have established uh, an accelerator lab, which looks into fostering innovation. And the uh, uh, Philippines is uh, uh, one of the few countries uh, 60 uh, countries uh, uh, that has uh, first got the opportunity to establish such a lab. And the lab services are available to all stakeholders to work with us in, in coming up with uh, innovative approaches. Last but not least, this is the beginning of the conversation that we would like to have uh, by way of a policy dialogue. We wanted to have local level dialogues to take place uh, uh, so that uh, individuals uh, uh, and uh, collectively all stakeholders uh, would work towards changing the social norms and build a coalition for the change that we are envisaging in the human development for Anthropocene. With this, I would like to say thank you very much for listening and I'll be delighted to answer any questions that you may have in the report findings. Thank you. Back to you, Char. Thank you so much, Ms. Yemi. And again, for those who, who might have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, panel on your screens. We will be answering your questions later on. Um, to build on what she has presented, on what Ms. Yemi has presented, we have a short clip explaining how interconnected human progress is with nature. And as mentioned, for the first time in history, instead of the planet shape, instead of the planet shaping humans and how we are living, humans are shaping the planet. The pressures are so great that scientists argue that we are in a new geologic age, the Anthropocene. We have made incred incredible progress. We have improved health, education, and livelihoods of billions. But our actions, particularly our dependence on fossil fuels and material consumption, are driving not just climate change and biodiversity collapse, but ocean acidification, air and water pollution, and land degradation. Ultimately, we may be destabilizing rather, the very systems upon which we rely on for survival at an unprecedented speed and scale. Now, to help us further unpack the key insights that Yemi has just presented, derived from the report and provide a localized context, we have invited speakers from different sectors for a panel discussion to be moderated by Dr. Antonio Lavinia, the Acting Executive Director of Manila Observatory. Dr. Tony has been an educator for nearly 40 years and is currently Professor of Law, Philosophy, Governance, and Politics in a dozen universities and learning institutions in the Philippines. He is currently the acting director of Manila Observatory. He is known for his climate change and environmental expertise and his long, adv long time advocacy of human rights, indigenous people's rights, good governance practices, and social entrepreneurship. He has been and is a leader of many Philippine and global institutions and organizations. He is widely published in the fields of law and governance, environment, human rights, social accountability, and social entrepreneurship. We are grateful to have him as moderator for our panel discussion this morning. 
Welcome, Attorney Lavinia. Thank you. And before we begin, I would also like to inform the audience that the questions shall be addressed after all the panelists have finished their discussion. Please direct your questions in the comment section or the Q&A section uh, on Zoom and uh, the Facebook Live's comment section as well. Thank you very much. And today we are also fortunate to have five panelists from various agencies and sectors to share with us their perspectives and insights on the 2020 Human Development Report. Our first panelist is presently the Undersecretary for National Development Policy and Planning at the National Economic and Development Authority. Among her major responsibilities is shepherding the formulation of the Philippine Development Plan, for which she also oversees the implementation. In addition, she is in charge of providing technical advice on policy issues to both the, the legislative and executive branches of the government, especially the committees of the NEDA board. Presently, she chairs the task group on recovery under the National Task Force Against COVID-19. She also chairs the technical working group on anticipatory and forward planning and a member of the sub-technical working group on data analytics under the interagency task force on the management of emerging infectious diseases. The speaker also chairs the social development committee technical board and the technical committee on tariff related matters and is a member of the development budget coordination committee of the NEDA board. She also heads the secretariat of the economic development cluster of the cabinet. Here as the representative of the government, let us also give a warm welcome to Undersecretary Rosemary G. Edelion. Welcome, Undersecretary. Our second panelist is a representative from the academe and an esteemed member of the Philippine Human Development Network. Dr. Emmanuel S. De Dios is Professor Emeritus at the University of the Philippines, where he spent four decades in the career of teaching and research at some point also serving as Dean of the UP School of Economics. He has written or edited a number of books, monographs, and journal articles, notably those dealing with the country's fiscal problems, poverty, human development, and the role of institutions in development. He is currently the president of the Human Development Network, which publishes the Philippine Human Development Report and sits on the board of Pulse Asia Research Incorporated, FEU Public Policy Center, and Peace and Equity Foundation, among others. He's a regular contributor to a revolving, revolving column in the Business World newspaper as well. Welcome, Dr. De Dios. Our next panelist is a representative of the civil society of a civil society organization for conservation. Attorney Jose Andres Ongi Canivel is a conservationist, environmental lawyer, and grant maker. He is the founding executive director of the Forest Foundation Philippines. Established in 2002, Forest Foundation provides grants to organizations and people that protect and conserve the country's most critical forests through community-led projects, research, capacity building, and advocacy efforts, among others. Under his leadership, the foundation has supported over 500 projects, which has improved the management of over 1.5 million hectares of forest lands, restored approximately 4,200 hectares of forests through the reintroduction and of appropriate native species, establishment of over 40 community conserved areas, and built over 60 community level enterprises. Thank you so much for joining us, Attorney Ongi. Our next panelist is a representative from the private sector. Mr. George Barcelona is presently the chairman of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the largest business organization in the country. He represents the private sector in the Industry Development Council and National Competitive Council. He is also one of the three Philippine representatives to the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. Hello, yes. He is the president. Hello, uh, Mr. Barcelon. He is the president of the Integrated Computer Systems, a pioneer in computer systems and peripherals. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Barcelon. Last but not the least, uh, our last panelist is a representative of the youth sector, who was also an important participant of the recently held regional launch of the Human Development Report here in Asia. Ms. Kisha Mayuga is an environmental planner and an urban cyclist. 
Her mission is to make safe and sustainable transformation, transportation rather, in the Philippines, which she currently does by working at the World Bank to make bike infrastructure in the country. She previously worked with the Asian Development Bank as a transport infrastructure cons consultant and is an active transport, transport advocate for the Move As One Coalition. She is also the founder of Life Cycles Philippines, a group dedicated to providing bikes to more than a thousand frontliners during the pandemic. She was recently awarded second runner-up in the Youth Leadership Award category for Life Cycles Philippines during the first United Nations Women's Empowerment Principles Awards in the Philippines. Let's all give a warm welcome to Ms. Keisha Mayuga. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ke Hi, Ms. Keisha. And before I turn it over to Dr. Lavinia again, we would like to invite everyone to please put in your comments and your questions via the Q&A chat box, which we will address later on after the panel discussion. Thank you so much for your cooperation and the floor is yours, Dr. Lavinia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for um, watching and listening to uh, this, this launch of the Philippine Development Report you, for the Human Development Report for 2020. Uh, it's a very interesting um, theme. Uh, I had actually asked whether this theme was chosen before the pandemic, and, 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 and yes. I was uh, it's interesting to watch the first video uh, uh, and glad actually that this is my field that I actually know what anthropocene is and have written about it even before uh, uh, this this report. Uh, we we have uh, uh, a very interesting and very distinguished panel uh, with us. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, with, with some general questions and go on to specifics. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, some panelists to lead the discussion, but please feel free to to come in um, uh, anytime, the other panelists. Uh, my first question is, a, is, an, is an overall uh, uh, question of the, the challenges that we are facing uh, today. COVID-19, high inequality, climate change, uh, and the strain this has put on our planet. Um, COVID-19 particularly is a testament to the pressures uh, that's being placed uh, by us. No, uh, I, I've actually worked on uh, the, on pandemic as a scenario for biological diversity uh, for almost 20 years now. And so this is something that in our field we've anticipated way back in 2000 when we, do the, we did the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that humanity was placing on wildlife and, and the planet. Uh, these pressures that threatens to reverse human development. And we, we've seen that in the, in the COVID-19 in, in the Philippines and in other countries uh, as well. Uh, so my question, and I'd, I'd like to address this first to um, to Under Secretary uh, Rosemary and uh, and and Dean Well, uh, what are the critical actions the Philippines could take to be able to achieve uh, high levels of human development uh, without putting damaging pressure on the planet as it builds better from the COVID nineteen uh, crisis? So uh, Under Secretary, uh, would you like to begin? Yes, uh, thank you for your difficult question. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a very, very uh, uh, challenging to say the least. Uh, yes, we know that uh, the COVID-19 has actually magnified this uh, relationship between uh, uh, the environment and, uh, and uh, human actions. Prior to uh, the COVID, we have actually finalized the Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. And uh, this was an, uh, an initiative that we began in uh, 2018. Uh, actually, 2017, uh, when we were doing the network analysis on the SDG, we have already uh, determined that a pivotal SDG is actually goal 12, which is on sustainable consumption and production. And there's not much that we knew about, uh, about it then. And so uh, we embarked on a study with the help from uh, the ADB and uh, we were able to come up with the uh, Philippine Action Plan in 2019. And uh, what, we, uh, what we hope to do actually for 2020 was to uh, begin the uh, actions that we have identified. We have identified that there should be four nodes 
there should be uh, something on policy action and regulation. So we have lined up uh, even uh, proposed legislations on this one. And then there's also something on uh, R&D, innovation and technology. That's the second node. The third node is on infrastructure uh, towards you know, green, uh, the green infrastructure uh, to encourage uh, the good practices and discourage the bad. And then the fourth one is on promotion and education. And it's really about uh, uh, editing the choices and then uh, you know uh, making people aware that this is the the, the good choice yeah so th that is uh, that is the, the thing that we are uh, we are we have uh, tried to do um, we were planning to do last year but of course um, now with the COVID, there are new challenges actually with respect to uh, planetary pressures. So we have identified also some uh, flash, uh, you know, red flags. Uh, one, obviously, there there is this uh, improving uh, uh, air quality in the urban areas and in the uh, ecotourism sites. Obviously, because you know uh, mobility is restricted, but we are also conscious that uh, there could be other. Uh, pressures on the planet. One is the increased uh, uh, increased volume of uh, hazardous waste, uh, especially hospital waste, and even you know households uh, using this uh, disposable ma mask and then not disposing them correctly. And then second is this move towards digitalization, which of course is, uh, is a good thing uh, because it makes us more resilient. But we are also concerned that this will actually, uh, you know, increase the volume of electronic waste. And uh, so far, we do not yet have a good way of disposing uh, electronic waste. Actually, that's also one of the things that we have flagged in the uh, uh, Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and, uh, and Production. But in any case, for this year, uh, we intend to uh, work closely with Congress with respect to the legislation uh, that we have already identified on the uh, PAP for SCP. And uh, moving uh, forward towards that, uh, uh, with respect to the what is under the purview of the NEDA, it's actually uh, on the PSA side, the Philippine Statistics Authority. We hope to uh, push forward with the uh, being able to account for uh, the ecosystem services, the environmental services, and then uh, hopefully uh, work on the study to be able to again estimate the the uh, the impact of certain production and consumption uh, practices on on the planet. So those are the things that are uh, lined up uh, in in the, in this very near uh, near period. I mean, 2021. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Under Secretary Edelion. Uh, What's interesting for me, and before I call on um, De Noel, maybe you can also uh, talk a bit about that in terms of experience so people can also learn from, from what, especially Ned has done. What's interesting with us is uh, sustainable development uh, has been uh, ingrained in our um, system of economic planning for quite a while now, uh, certainly since 1992. Uh, uh, I, I do remember uh, uh, the Earth Summit and and how uh, under President Ramos that, that integration of uh, of uh, sustainable development or planning and so in that sense you must be quite prepared to to you have mainstreamed this already in our in our planning and and therefore uh, is quite prepared to deal with this this multiple crisis that we're facing now is would that be uh, correct uh, under Secretary De Leon. Uh... Well, yes and no. Yes, in the case that uh, you know the the consciousness is there, and uh, we have all actually mainstreamed uh, some processes in, uh, especially in the uh, appraisal of projects, programs of, and projects. I'm talking about the ICC process. So we have uh, certain uh, we we require certain uh, uh, clearances to make sure that is uh, this are uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, environmentally sustainable. Uh, no, because there's still a lot that needs to be done. And uh, I'm talking more about the, uh, the measurement part and uh, that uh, for, for each and every individual to be aware of uh, how much, just how much they are, they are actually uh, impacting or adversely affecting uh, the environment in terms of, uh, you know, just consumption, uh, there's the production, of course, and, and the usual, uh, just the usual everyday practices. And this is the thing that uh, we want to highlight, actually, by uh, being able to value uh, 
uh, the impact of this uh, of this uh, practices. So, so we hope to be able to uh, to do that uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's actually a very good entry point for Dr. Uh, Dinoel, who uh, I must confess has been the most influential economist, economist in my thinking in all these 25, 30 years that I've been working on policy. And because it's really a question of what, what more in fact should we do to really uh, uh, confront this, this crisis and this issue. So, Dinoel, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Tony. And thank you for your remarks, Rose. Um, Actually, it's very reassuring that the government has uh, uh, plans to uh, anticipate the, the challenge of the Anthropocene. Uh, uh, I can only agree with the priorities that the government has uh, outlined. No? Uh, questions of policy and regulation, R&D, uh, which, which has a special uh, meaning for uh, academics like us, infrastructure and uh, education and uh, information no? of, the, of this, I think, uh, well, first of all, a general remark. No? It's good that the government bureaucracy has uh, uh, a broad idea, in fact, more detailed ideas regarding uh, what ought to be done. What seems to be missing is that fourth part, which is the transmission of this uh, mindset on the part of uh, uh, our uh, workers in government and and I think, in fact, there, there might not even be, it might not even be all of government that has this mindset. The transmission of that mindset to the general public, to the policymakers first, and then to the general public. Uh, from what I know, Philippine government, we're very slow to realize um, slow onset uh, phenomena like um, climate change, like, uh, uh, well, for example, anthro the Anthropocene itself, the, the, the observation that human material is now uh, greater than the bio natural biomass of the, of the world. No? That it, it takes a big mind and a long horizon to realize that. No? I, I don't think all of our politicians, for example, are, are aware of that, much less the general public. And uh, I, I, I realize we'll come into stakeholders later on, but. I think uh, what's important is to convey, uh, uh, if it's just piecemeal, if, you, if we're going to just uh, introduce legislation here and there, you know, uh, they might add up to something, but the, the public needs to know what that something is. Uh, the, what is the whole picture? Uh, when we talk about uh, sustainable development, for example, uh, the, the larger question is what does the, uh, future economy, what is the, the future economy supposed to look like that is uh, consistent with mitigating the challenges of the Anthropocene. There is no clear picture of that at the moment. And I like what Rose said regarding, and the Secretary De Jong said about editing choices. I remember, uh, I think, Rose, you were there uh, when this ambition, um, what do you call it? The ambition um, survey was uh, put out uh, that at least was an honest, I think, an honest representation of what people thought their future should be. The question is, how consistent is that future with uh, a sustainable uh, environment? How consistent is it with mitigating the, the bad effects of the, the, the Anthropocene? Uh, that has not been processed. There is no uh, editing uh, of that uh, of that uh, vision. Is that the vision that the government, is the government simply going to take the vision of the people as they are and then uh, uh, push it forward? It seems to be the wrong approach because we already said that business as usual cannot be the, the answer, especially after the pandemic. When is that editing going to happen? What are the elements of that? of that editing of people's choices. The, the report also talks about uh, values and norms needing to be changed. It's a very big challenge to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's the more important part. Uh, it's good that there's a realization on some, in some parts of the bureaucracy about the challenges involved. But the more important part is how to convey that vision and those uh, challenges to the 
A, policy makers, and B, the public, the public at large. Uh, I think that's the most important task uh, for which uh, there's two things. One is uh, uh, the other part, which is mentioned by Rose also, R&D and science. We just need the facts first. We need, before we can inform the public and make a uh, convincing argument, we need the facts. Uh, and we, in, in other words, we need the causes and the, the, the consequences on people's, on people's lives. And if possible, we need this at the very granular level, at the level of local communities, for example. Uh, the, the report alluded to a, a problem where people realized the importance of the issue, but they were less willing to take action. I, I can predict that one reason they're unwilling to take action is they don't know what to do. Yes. What are the practical uh, things that people can do in order to mitigate it? How do, uh, and this is a classic problem in economics, not collective action. If you're alone, uh, you don't think your action matters because it does not contribute to a real improvement of the, the situation. Therefore, there needs to be that uh, uh, cohesive uh, uh, collective vision in order that people get motivated to, uh, to act on an individual basis. You only act if you think it will matter, even if there's a problem, but you don't think your action will make any difference, you will not act. And therefore, again, it goes back to that part about A, you need the information and B, you need to communicate it to, to people. I doubt even whether uh, it, uh, uh, maybe Rose is the, the exception, uh, whether government has itself fashioned the long-term uh, vision let, uh, for let's say for 50 years, what, what will the Philippine economy be built on? Uh, what are the drivers of that kind of an economy that is sustainable? That's, those are the kinds of long-term questions that uh, can answer the problem of the Anthropocene. After all, you're talking about a, an era. You're not talking about a six-year plan. You're talking that's about long-term changes that, uh, that's why it's hard. Because eh? people cannot imagine beyond, <laughs> beyond yeah. a week I from now. No, I, I have to agree. I mean, I, I actually that's why I people are actually ask me why why is a lawyer and an activist heading a scientific organization uh, that's uh, one of the oldest in the in in Asia, right? Manila Observatory, precisely because of what Dean Noel said. Uh, the it's so challenging to get that information to make the right decisions uh, at at all levels. I mean, uh, and my my follow up question to Dean Noel is. Uh, uh, Obviously, and, and I think we can agree on this that this is not reflected on our national budget. <laughs> uh, that the, this, this is the importance of this, and and what can we do to try to change that? Uh, <laughs> well, I I can create another commission, <laughs> but really, uh, some thinking is going on in government. Uh, maybe it needs reinforcement. Uh, from the, the scientific community. Uh, maybe it needs uh, a more cohesive, well, first of all, uh, the leadership must acknowledge that it's important and therefore give it importance. As much importance as uh, constitutional uh, amendment. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there needs to be a decision, and this is where the vision comes in, there needs to be a vision on the part of the leadership, a decision to say, no, this is important, uh, I will not live to see it uh, in my term, but it is so important. I will get things started. And uh, I will get the most important uh, opinion makers, uh, the most informed scientists to, to sit down and propose to the people, uh, propose to the public, hey, you know, this is what's going on. And we think this, uh, this is a problem. And... Uh, it's uh, this is what we think ought to be done, and you can disagree with it. We can yeah. debate about it, but we should talk about it at, at all circumstances. One thing we should talk about, and I'll, I'll go now to the other panelists. Uh, one thing we should talk about um, 
is the importance of uh, uh, managing natural resources uh, well, both as a defense to the negative change that will happen, as well as to create real lasting change that would be would be good. And so there's a lot of talk about nature-based uh, solutions, uh, even for climate uh, change, where where some data said that say that 37 percent of reductions can can be can be done through nature-based uh, solutions. Certainly, uh, uh, forest uh, dealing with our forest, uh, uh, both preventing further deforestation, uh, enhancing reforestation efforts and, and forest management efforts are, are key solutions uh, globally. I've actually worked in that field in the Climate Change Convention for over 20 years. I've led a lot of the effort there. So I actually like to call on Attorney Canivelle of the Forest Foundation, uh, if you could share uh, uh, an assessment of our effort in the Philippines uh, to use nature-based solutions. And, and this is not just the government, but, but lots of uh, efforts from the uh, community, the private sector, the, the, the NGO sector uh, on, uh, on, on using nature-based solutions uh, to bring lasting change. Uh, where are we now and what can we do to, 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 to do this better? Ongi? Thank you, Dean Tony, for the question. Well, um, in, in terms of assessing our efforts at uh, nature-based solutions, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with some of the bad first, but I, I'd like to end up with the good ones. First, uh, I think um, we certainly, uh, as, as uh, uh, Doc, Doc Emmanuel said earlier, we certainly require a bit more information. We need science to, and, and, uh, and also indigenous knowledge to inform our decisions to generate baselines to measure our success. I think that's something that we still uh, lack. Um, second, uh, we need uh, to change our approach from projects to programs, uh, from small efforts to interrelated activities and campaigns. Uh, we have earnest efforts in terms of forest management and in terms of reforestation. We have the national, we had the national greening program. We currently have the expanded national greening program. We also have the forest management program from the DNR uh, and the forest law enforcement program from the DNR. Uh, but this, all of these are, 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 are great on paper, but I think they did not uh, sufficiently think about sustainability and they did not uh, think about ecosystem or landscape level design in, into the approach. Um, for the good part, however, uh, I, we ha I have to, to admit that I am I'm, I'm actually uh, inspired by uh, the youth and civil society wanting to engage in forest conservation and uh, forest management. Uh, in our social media pages, we almost on a daily basis get queries, get uh, requests from uh, millennials, from youth groups wanting to participate in efforts at forest conservation, at forest protection. Um, so that for me is, 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 is very, very uh, inspiring. On the part of uh, a government, actually, we're, it seems that we're willing to invest in forest protection and forest restoration. The National Greening Program uh, enjoyed billions in terms of budget all allocations and appropriations. The same with the forest protection. So there's, there's uh, uh, interest clearly on the part of government to provide funding for it. Uh, and, and last but not least, we see local governments wanting to do more, offering up their own uh, services, offering up their own capacities to engage in forest management and forest protection. Um, so, so I hope I've, I've answered your, your question, Dinton. No, no that, that's, that's, very, uh, that's very good man, and very, very, very uh, uh, constructive. And I'll actually go back to that uh, later on when we, when we talk about uh, uh, stakeholders and what more stakeholders can, can, can do in forests and other things as well. Uh, obviously, one very important uh, Stakeholder for uh, for us, I mean, in in, in this uh, in the Anthropocene is 
uh, because they did play a big role to get us to uh, where we are, uh, you know, in both the positive and negative sense, but also will play a very critical role to get us out of this, uh, at least this negative uh, cycle and, and make it a positive cycle. Uh, and that's the private sector. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to call on uh, our, our colleague, uh, Mr. Barton, Chairman of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, to, to uh, share with us his, his thinking after hearing the, the, uh, the uh, report uh, uh, and, and, and this uh, uh, new index, the Planetary Pressures Adjusted Human Development uh, uh, Index. Uh, what, what does the private sector think about this and, and, uh, and uh, how can it account or make sure that it monitors its uh, impact on planetary uh, pressure, uh, as well as have incentive mechanisms to, to uh, make sure that uh, 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 it contributes to sustainable development instead of what I call development uh, aggression. That, that's uh, in, in my lexicon, the opposite of uh, sustainable development is aggressive, uh, is development aggression where, where you disregard people and planet for, for a single uh, bottom line of, of profit. Uh, Sir Barcelona, would you like to say something? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Tony Vinyan. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, we are really, uh, because of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we realized that uh, we have to prioritize uh, what's, in, what's important to the society. Of course, health now we realize is very important. Uh, but talking about the human index development, uh, one area that uh, that uh, from the government side and also private sector is the fact that uh, our young youth are young. When I say young, that's a uh, one year old to five to six years old. We are experiencing almost a 28 percent malnourishment. Okay. And this is going to take a huge impact on our productivity down the line. Uh, we know very well in the last PISA uh, worldwide uh, test for uh, high school students, the Philippine ended as the last or very, uh, very low in ranking. So all of this uh, tells us that uh, the uh, our human resource has to be uh, given focus. And I pointed out earlier about the malnourishment of our young because this effect they are stunted and this affect their learning capabilities. Now that's only one factor. The other factor is that uh, I agree with what most of the points of uh, what our panelists have said, uh, Yusek, uh, Rosemary, and, uh, and the others. Uh, the action taken by the, from the private sector is that we realize that uh, somehow uh, the climate change has something to do with its country's uh, uh, policy regarding uh, pollution uh, processes. Okay? Now the country is holding back on the use of coal fire power generation, which is good because power, I mean, when you generate power through coal, uh, it's very unhealthy with all the suits that is being uh, thrown up in the air. Uh, but having said that, the long term, you mentioned about incentive. Okay? One thing that we must realize, uh, we must consider giving incentive to people or consumer who helps in reducing the carbon footprint. Okay? I know UN has uh, programs to incentivize companies in their production, in their energy, uh, uh, non-traditional energy on carbon footprint. But down the line, I think consumers should be part of it. Uh, I, I saw a study wherein the world's resources uh, to cope up with the demand of the economy must be about seven and a half times. So with that data, it's very glaring that uh, we are consuming more than what the earth can provide. 
And at the same time, it's really uh, part of the whole uh, cycle of uh, generating uh, more carbon dioxide up in the air. And this has affected the climate and everything. Uh, uh, some people would uh, allude that, uh, you know, because of the human uh, uh, uncontrolled desire and consumption that has brought about some sickness. Uh, yes, I do agree, but we have to look back that uh, even during the uh, turn of the 20th century, when we had the Spanish flu, okay, the world was not as industrialized as what it is now, okay. But all of, but there were other conditions that brought about uh, some of this sickness. There were war, there were famine, and everything. Okay? So now we are going to the 21st century, and we're facing this. Uh, but we're happy that uh, with technology, uh, that uh, vaccine, at least the one that we saw or being. Uh, getting FDA approval uh, has really broken all the record as far as the time to develop. Before vaccine takes about three, four years to develop. Now it takes less than a year and you have more than 10 companies in that, in that, uh, in that uh, landscape of producing uh, vaccine. So these are all indicative that uh, our human species is moving forward. Uh, uh, we have about world population now of 7.8 billion. And I think the projected number of the world's population by 2050 is closer to 10 billion. So we got to ask ourselves, uh, what would be the, uh, what would we bequeath to the future generations? If the way we run things is uh, always consume uh, based on uh, consumption, I think the problem will get worse. So definitely from the United Nations, they must do something about the incentivizing how people can consume less. Nowadays, we hear about cryptocurrency. Who knows? It may be far-fetched, but down the line, we might have, crypt we might have carbon footprint currency. Yeah. If you spend, if you, if you, if you, if you consuming things that benefits the carbon footprint, you get certain currencies that you can use for other things. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think that would be the long term. Uh, but as far as uh, as far as uh, human development, uh, especially in the scenario of our country, I usually share with people that uh, if you prioritize, I call it the five five H. The first H is hunger. That is still an issue with us. Okay. The second H is health, availability of uh, you know, health care, affordable. The third is housing. Okay. Those are all part of the human uh, development. The fourth is higher education. We need that. I mean, especially now in the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Okay. And the fifth, uh, which is part of the H, is our happiness index. So I'll sum it up. Those are the things that we as in the private sector are concerned, and we're doing uh, all the effort to cooperate with government or to uh, agencies like the United uh, UNDP. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. President. That was very refreshing to, to hear that from a private sector person. I actually want to circle back to uh, Attorney Canivel uh, on this issue of incentives, uh, specifically for forest, uh, incentives for communities, uh, incentives for uh, the private sector, for even for local governments. Uh, you know, what are the considerations that we have to, to deal with uh, if we want to make progress on this? Ongi? Yep. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, uh, as... as uh, I think it's uh, incentives indeed uh, play a critical role in terms of uh, advancing forest conservation and forest management uh, in the country. But but in addition to incentives or, or perhaps to to contextualize uh, incentives, uh, we should have other uh, critical considerations. First, I, I alluded to this earlier. We need to develop a, a landscape level thinking or lens in terms of looking at where to plant, where to invest, 
uh, our resources in, in restoration uh, and in conservation. Uh, we need to, to look at, uh, uh, look at uh, protected areas. We need to look at uh, critical habitats in relation to uh, farms, to agriculture areas, to uh, peri-urban areas, as well as to cities. So we need to develop that sort of uh, lens. Second, we have to ensure the participation of stakeholders uh, and the stewardship by stakeholders. Um, uh, and here is where perhaps you can provide incentives to communities uh, to act as real stakeholders for, for forest, uh, which they depend on. Uh, indigenous communities, indigenous peoples have shown us uh, across generations and, and in century, uh, across centuries even, that you know, uh, empowered uh, uh, communities, empowered indigenous peoples can take care of uh, forests and manage forests uh, for biodiversity, but also for critical ecosystem services. Um, in terms of uh, uh, empowering uh, local government units as well. There's, there's, there's space for that. Uh, they have the forest land use plan. They have the comprehensive land use plan, which is required of them. Perhaps uh, some of uh, resources can be put in so that they can take a more proactive role in stewardship and in protecting and conserving their forests. Uh, when I talk about stakeholders, the private sector, of course, is part of that. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen private sector, uh, both internationally and here in the Philippines, take a, a deeper role in terms of managing resources, in terms of protecting their own uh, uh, basis for business. So I think that's, that's something that we need to encourage and that we need to, in fact, uh, promote. Um, incentives, for, for my last part, incentives can be linked to uh, a critical consideration for forest management efforts in the Philippines, and that is support for livelihoods and enterprise development. Um, we cannot take care of forests if we don't take care of the livelihoods of the health of forest dependent communities. So if we provide them with livelihoods, if we develop enterprises and support these with appropriate incentives, uh, then we're able to conserve forests, we're able to provide for uh, the health and hunger uh, uh, and perhaps housing of uh, forest dependent communities. Uh, and and uh, of course, incentives, both in terms of promoting participation, uh, enhancing returns and rewards for those who participate in forest conservation uh, can then uh, play a, a, a very big role in promoting uh, planetary health. Thank you, uh, Ongi. I, I, I'd like to go now to Keisha um, and talk about uh, stakeholders, especially the, the youth. Uh, I think every one of the panelists have uh, uh, really concluded that uh, the magnitude of, of this era, of the, of the challenges of this era, uh, requires a whole of nation and whole of society, whole of the world approach, in fact. Um, and uh, the, the role of the youth uh, to get us there is so important. I mean, and I would like to ask Asia to share that perspective to us. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you also to the rest of our panelists for sharing. Um, really, uh, the first step to making these changes is, um, I think everyone mentioned it earlier, is awareness about how our actions affect the planet as a whole. The daily decisions we make, how we consume food, how we travel, what we wear, adds up along with the millions of others doing the same thing. Cities are a key factor in lowering global CO2 emissions, making up 70% of all emissions in the world. And in turn, this also affects our rainforests, our natural resources. And one of the things we can really change is the way we travel. Transportation accounts for the majority of our missions in cities, and we have to start changing our mindsets from being car-centric to moving more people efficiently, not how fast you can get from one place to another with a car. The past few months have taught us that active transport combined with adequate public transport can not only help lower carbon emissions, but also mitigate the spread of COVID-19. If we want to make changes, it starts with making differences in how we live every day. 
Um, for example, instead of taking your car out to go to the office or taking a grab to the mall, why not try cycling or walking? My, personally, my personal advocacy as a youth leader has been to encourage people to try bike commuting. Maybe pre-pandemic, it would have been, it would have seemed like an extreme sport to even try biking in the streets of Metro Manila. But now, um, more and more people are choosing to cycle. Some out of necessity because of the lack of adequate public transport, especially during the pandemic. But now, many are choosing to do so because they see the benefits of cycling in many aspects. Because of this surge of new cyclists in the country, we've seen bike lanes popping up in different cities, and we've, we're even expecting more than 300 kilometers by this year in Metro Manila alone. These changes would not have been possible without support from civil society groups, government agencies, and the private sector. But more importantly, it's thanks to the thousands of Filipinos choosing to cycle. If the thousands didn't choose to cycle, maybe we wouldn't have gotten where we are now. Every cyclist on the road is part of this movement. So everyone, including those of us tuned in right now, has the power to choose today on how you want to impact our environment with your lifestyle. Um, it's also important that our society allows for these decisions to make it easier for us. And I think you said Edelion and Dr. Dedios and everyone mentioned this earlier. If we have different sectors supporting a lifestyle that's better for humankind and the planet, it will make it easier for more people to jump on the bandwagon of change. For example, cycling in Metro Manila has no doubt increased from pre-pandemic times. According to a recent SWS survey on the Department of Health's COVID-19 campaign, 87% of Philippines believe that roads in Philippine cities and municipalities will be better off if public transportation, bicycles, and pedestrians are given priority over private vehicles. 85% uh, of Filipinos agree with the statement, it is possible for my city or municipality to become a great place for walking and cycling. There is willingness among Filipinos. Now what we have, as, we have to do as a society is to help make it possible for Filipinos to decide to live better through improved infrastructure and policies. Make protected bike lanes, improve the state of public transportation, prioritize sidewalks for pedestrians, there is proof that Filipinos want this. Now what we need to do is act on them. We all have a responsibility to make decisions for a better planet. While we may all be experts in our own respective fields, I think it's especially important to listen what the youth has to say. It's important to include the youth in the conversation, especially since we're trying to innovate and change from the old normal to a better normal. The youth can play a key role in bringing technology to improve systems and continuing best practices to pass down to the next generation. What we need is cooperation from generations before us to help usher in the changes we need to make for a better future. We all have a stake in this planet, so let's work together to make it better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Keisha. Um, before I go to the question, answer this one, really big elephant in the room that I'd like any of the panelists, uh, but I'm gonna start with Din, Din uh, Didios if he, if he wants to, because he's worked on it a lot, uh, which is in this uh, uh, 2020 uh, report, uh, which is inequality. I mean, you know, the, the, it's a, like a big elephant in the, in the room, um, in the Anthropocene that, that uh, uh, as bad as it is for everyone, uh, the pandemic and climate change and all of these things are even worse for the poor. Uh, and it drags down the fact that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, inequality, drags down, as, as we saw in the data, drags down the rest of uh, society. H how do we address this, uh, 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 colleagues, uh, Dr. Didios, others that might want to say something about, about this very important uh, elephant in the room in, in, in this report. Tony, um, um, actually there are two, there, there've always been two perennial questions in uh, Philippine development. And one is poverty alleviation, the other is uh, inequality. The two are related, but also distinct. I think in the before the pandemic, the country was making uh, great progress actually in poverty alleviation. That uh, uh, that part of the agenda was uh, uh, being addressed. What was not being addressed was the issue of uh, vulnerability. People who are 
uh, no longer poor, statistically defined, but still uh, on the verge or uh, precar in precarious uh, situations. No? Uh, if you compare the Philippines with other uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, the middle class in the Philippines has been growing, but not as, but not as fast as um, those in other countries. And uh, the vulnerable has also uh, been bigger than what you find in, in other countries. When we talk about inequality, it's really not just the poverty alleviation, which things like the four Ps have, has uh, addressed. It's also that, that the precarious section of the population that is vulnerable and then the lower, lower middle class, which in cases of uh, uh, catastrophes like the current uh, pandemic uh, are actually going to be uh, uh, pulled down. Uh, into the lower uh, lower ranks, no, and the reason for that is the their differential access to uh, other things like uh, healthcare, like uh, security of uh, security of employment, no, uh, so that uh, you see the effect of inequality manifesting itself in cases of large catastrophes or pandemics like this. The incidence is very different when it comes to the upper middle class or better and the lower middle class and lower. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, some, of, some people have fallen uh, between the, the cracks as between the, a growth that um, is very biased for uh, fairly well off and a public policy that uh, um, rhetorically and at least I, I think uh, in the last few years also substantively addressing the extremely, extremely poor. No? But the inequality re will remain even if you are able to address uh, extreme, extreme poverty because there is that part of the population that is not exactly poor and therefore is not the subject of uh, large uh, government attention. And then also not the rich who are benefiting from, uh, from economic growth. And so there needs to be a policy that's in between for example, um, um, unemployment insurance, we, we don't have that. Uh, so people may be employed and they, therefore they're not especially uh, statistically poor. Uh, but when things like this happen, uh, there is nowhere to go for these people. SSS is a big joke in terms of uh, uh, how it protects people from uh, spells of unemployment. Health insurance uh, can be much better uh, to prevent uh, catastrophic uh, illnesses from uh, pulling people down. So it's really, I think, social protection mechanisms, not, uh, not just poverty alleviation, but social protection mechanisms are needed in order to address uh, inequality. Uh, and of course, it will require uh, avenues. So in order to stop this, uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, resources have to be uh, devoted, but also smarter policies like uh, insurance schemes are not all tax revenue, by the way. Uh, they are a mutual, it's like a mutual fund. And during good times, you contribute, bad times, you, you draw out. So it's both a combination of resources as well as design uh, that, that is needed to solve uh, inequality. Thank you. Uh, you That's what I you, think. So, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dinoel. You said, uh, Edelion, would you like to uh, uh, comment on this as well, since this is yeah. really also uh, top yes, of uh, mind? Yeah, thank next. you. But uh, if I may also comment on uh, some of the issues raised earlier. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, for instance, uh, Dr. DeJoss mentioned about the uh, editing of choices, let's say, with respect to the ambition at in 2040. Actually, you'll be glad to know that we have. We have already uh, done those uh, because we think that uh, two things there actually stand out as uh, you know a red flag with respect to sustainable development, and this is really uh, with respect to transport, and then with respect to uh, home ownership. And so we have actually edited that choice uh, into uh, um, efficient mobility options. In fact, uh, before this, actually two years ago, yeah, before the pandemic, we have done two uh, studies 
which is actually to improve the walkability of uh, Cebu City and then Davao City. And uh, we were supposed to leave, supposedly last year, uh, we were supposedly doing the uh, synthesis of this, uh, if these two studies so that we can actually replicate it in the other uh, urban uh, centers. And then we have also done uh, two studies on urban carrying capacity, Baguio City and Tagaytay City. And then again, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, progressing forward uh, to uh, uh, synthesizing all the lessons learned so that it can be replicated. Anyway, so it was uh, kind of, we were on pause uh, last year, but we're hoping to do that uh, this year. Now talking about, um, um, inequality. Uh, as mentioned, we have, uh, with respect to poverty, then are uh, actually, uh, as uh, as already uh, mentioned, uh, the biggest uh, effort initiative began by uh, the previous administration is actually the four Ps. And uh, under this administration, what happened was uh, uh, there was a top up in terms of the, uh, the amount of the transfer. And there was also an expansion of uh, the coverage of, let's say, the social pension uh, program. And then uh, what we are, um, we, what we have done last year actually you know, series of uh, Zoom meetings is uh, uh, trying to finalize the social protection floor, and hopefully it will be uh, it will be approved early this year. So that social protection floor uh, uh, actually already identifies you know the different shocks that are mostly uh, expected in the case of the Philippines, and who are the different sectors that are most vulnerable, and what. Uh, what should be, you know, the assistance needed, and that there should be some way of automaticity with respect to the to the provision of this uh, of these uh, resources. So as you know, uh, what we have done as well is uh, with respect to the reform packages that we have passed. Uh, previously, uh, the most crucial of which would be probably the, the train one, where we have already determined that there could be inflationary pitch, uh, um, pressures here. And we have identified that this will be those who will be affected. And so there was the unconditional cash transfer uh, to be given to the bottom 50%. So even though that we know that uh, you know poverty is uh, much less than that, but it will be to the bottom 50%. And then with respect to this, uh, the social amelioration fund, for instance, uh, so social amelioration program that was given out uh, uh, for this uh, pandemic response, it was actually uh, provided to the bottom 70%. So, so uh, we we recognize that it's not just the the poor that are actually adversely affected by this, but also the ones that uh, you know uh, beyond poor but not really rich. And so there is that uh, that conscious. Uh, uh, Thinking, uh, of course, it's still a matter of uh, of resources. Uh, that's also uh, that's also a problem for us. But uh, uh, yes, so hopefully this uh, social protection floor will be uh, approved this year. And yes, we hear you about being able to turn you know, the transmission of this mindset. Uh, again, uh, like I said, we were put on pause. Uh, there, there's actually a question here that uh, that I, I saw about the extended producer uh, responsibility. Yeah. That's actually uh, top of our list with respect to the legislation, uh, the proposed legislation on the uh, Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. We just hope that we can go back to uh, uh, really uh, working, uh, devoting uh, time on this one. Thank you. I was going to ask uh, Mr. Barcelona to respond on that question about extended producer responsibility, which is really just about internalization of yes. the private by the private sector of the negative environmental impacts, I mean, uh, would you like to say something about that, uh, Mr. Barcelon? Um, you, know, I mean, how, the, uh, uh, you know, the inequality is uh, it's very sad in the sense that, uh, you know, our, our unemployment rate and the un underemployment is still very high uh, because we're talking about, uh, we're now in a global world where in, uh, you're talking about being competitive and competitive uh, but uh, really uh, means that our education skill sets is very crucial. I do agree that we should have some social safety uh, network, uh, safety network for our people, but then that would add cost uh, as far as uh, you know, cost on on uh, on uh, on uh, companies. Uh, lately, uh, the one thousand pesos uh, additional uh, contribution. Uh, has been uh, set back 
uh, primarily it was untimely also because we have this COVID-19. And, uh, and uh, there are issues uh, aside from uh, just the human cost. Uh, the other aspect that I think the country should really look at is to liberalize uh, you know, many of our negative lists to allow more foreign investment to create more jobs. Uh, uh, we, we, we try to attract as many foreign investors to our country. But unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the favorite destination now is Vietnam uh, and uh, Indonesia. Indonesia just lately has uh, reduced their negative list of uh, sectors of uh, industry from 300 something to 48. So we do have a long way to go. Uh, we have the pending uh, foreign investment uh, bill. Uh, and then we also have the uh, uh, bill for uh, forest, uh, sustaining the forest uh, management. So all of this, I think, is very important, crucial for us. With the government's program of Balik Provincia, uh, there should be more encouragement in the agri sectors. Uh, we're in, uh, you know, we, it has two benefits. First, uh, you create a livelihood for people. And secondly, we could be more food self-sufficiency. Uh, the the uh, one saving grace for our economy now is that uh, our foreign uh, remittances is still quite high. Uh, earlier, uh, some economists were saying that uh, remittances will be reduced by at least double digits. And uh, from the report of uh, BSP, that uh, it has just gone down by about a few percentage. So that's still holding up the economy. Uh, but uh, the, uh, as, as was noted down by USEC uh, Rosemary, we take pause because of this COVID-19 and uh, consumption has really dropped. Uh, but all the essential uh, sectors are still doing well. Food sectors, uh, uh, medical field sectors, uh, uh, hygiene related sectors are doing well. Of course, the the, the sector that's really exceptionally well is the tel tel telecom. Everybody now texts quite a lot and they meet through Zoom meeting. So uh, I don't know whether they, they should contribute more to the society in view that they are really one of the beneficiary of this COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. That's what I have to say. It's, uh, it's really a long term. It's really a challenge. Uh, the inequality, when you talk about it, you talk about inequality in societies, inequality in countries. Uh, I would rather that we focus on our country and really make our country be more attractive and not just encouraging foreign investment, but also the local investors. Uh, and uh, quite often I've, uh, said, I've said this openly that the LGUs uh, must really uh, put effort in being more business friendly. Okay, you know very well we have the uh, ARTA, which is the uh, the agency that is tasked to reduce bureaucracy. Uh, but sad to say, the reality is it's still there. Uh, maybe it has uh, been uh, contained a bit, uh, but again, uh, from the business sectors, there's still a lot of complaint that uh, it's not so easy. It's not so easy to really do business here in the Philippines. So all of this, all of these factors will come into play as far as I know when you talk about inequalities. And, uh, uh, you know, talking about the issue of what we're facing now on the uh, pandemic, COVID pandemic, uh, you see every day in the paper about the vaccine, okay? And uh, you're talking about the availability of the vaccine second quarter or third quarter of this year, okay? So in the meantime, what do we do in the next six, seven months? We really need to re-inject, you know, life into the economy. Because of this pandemic, as you mentioned in your opening statement, it's the marginalized that's taking the brunt of this COVID-19. And the only way we can do it is to have more economic activities. And I, I, I shared this thought, I said, you know, yes, we're still waiting for the vaccine. But on the other side, we should, we should really look at the, uh, the uh, availability of affordable, uh, screening test. Uh, it has been talked about in the saliva test, and uh, of course, before we used the, the antibodies, antigen, PCR, which is which is very prohibitive as far as price is concerned. 
for the marginalized is quite expensive. Uh, so if there's a test that we can have and available to the private sectors, that is the only way that we can remove this cloud of invisibility of the COVID-19. We're so scared of it because we think it's invisible and anybody can be, get, get infected. And which is true, you're not careful about the uh, uh, hygiene protocols. But again, you you're balancing between life and livelihood. So there are, there are uh, as I said, there are developments in the medical field. If we, if we can be uh, given uh, the flexibility by the DOH when we can do our testing with available test uh, tool test test tool kits that would really help uh, opening up the economy and then this would lessen the inequalities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm already going through the different questions in the uh, chat and in the question and answer um, uh, um, uh, item. Uh, I mean area. Uh, this one I addressed to Angi, and this will probably be your last uh, uh, um, chance to say something, Angi, as we start wrapping up. Uh, uh, there's a question about grassroots communities in, in, in the Q&A, and uh, you, you've answered some of that, but I want to phrase it in another way so that you can, uh, you can address something very specific, uh, which is that we know that uh, uh, the issues of sustainability, inequality, and social justice can be all dealt with if we are able to enable grassroots communities uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to do good things and to benefit from what you call nature-based solutions. How can we have an en enabling environment for, for this to happen? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for the question, Dean Tony. First, I agree that, that when we talk about nature-based solutions, uh, we address many things, uh, uncertainty, we, uh, uh, we, uh, we can address food security, we can, uh, we can provide resilience, but at, that, but, the most, uh, but at the core of a lot of nature-based solutions is participation by communities, by forest-dependent communities, by rural communities. So I think here is, this is where the strength of nature-based solution lies. We are able to uh, engage communities, we're able to engage indigenous peoples, we're able to engage rural populations uh, and, and have them uh, uh, with the help of government, private sector and local governments be stewards of natural resources, be the planters, the caregivers of, of, of trees. Uh, they can be protectors of forests. They can be uh, protectors of water and watersheds. They can uh, protect and conserve plants and animals from which medicine and from which uh, a lot of economic gains come from. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, support or enabling uh, local communities, we have to look at three things. First, we have to look at the policy framework. Uh, we start... Uh, we still unfortunately have a very outdated uh, overall uh, forest framework, forest law framework. We still operate under PD 705 uh, for a large part. And this still uh, espouses uh, an industrialized forest management approach. Whereas we've already moved towards uh, community-based forest management. And I think that's, that's a direction that we are taking, but we need to enhance that further. So we need to enhance our forest laws and policies to provide incentives for those that participate, to provide support for local governments who want to take better actions, to, to enable scientists and researchers to contribute to forest conservation activities and measures. Uh, the second one is, uh, uh, the second, uh, I, I talked about the three things. Second, uh, we need to engage the youth. Uh, it's, yep, sorry, yep, we, we need to engage the youth. You know, it's, it's easy to talk about you know, forest conservation and forest problems, but the youth, I tell you, already have solutions to a lot of the problems that, we, that we're citing. We've engaged a lot of them and they propose, proposed workable solutions. So I think that's, that's, that's key to enabling communities to work towards forest protection. Link them to the youth, link them to entrepreneurs, link and, and provide an overall uh, supportive framework. Thank you, yes. Dean. Yes, and I'd like, uh, in that spirit, then I'd like Keisha to be the last person in the panel, to the last word, the youth uh, person to, you know, and how could we make sure that the youth gets heard uh, 
um, more loudly actually, Keisha. Uh, do you have any ideas for that? Then I will wrap up after you. Yes, uh, thank you again for all our panelists. And I'm glad that um, there, there is a youth representative here because um, as previously mentioned by Attorney Canivel, it's really important to listen to the youth and to involve the youth in everything that we're doing. I mean, um, we, you may be experts or, you know, have all that, um, have all that experience, but um, there's a different kind of energy and innovativeness that, they, that young people can really bring. And it's especially important because we're the ones who will be passing it down to the next generation. So um, I think some things that we need to uh, really take note of is um, whatever sector that we're in, it's important to really involve the youth, not just you know, have them there as a token youth, just, just to say you have a young person there, but actually listen to us young people. Because, um, you know, the pandemic even taught us that um, it, it forced us to move into um, digitization and more going into more technologies and th th technologies and who better to help usher that in than us young people. Because, you know, um, if we want to really change, we have to keep looking towards the future and keep asking, wh what do you think is a good idea for this? Or, you know, what do you think is a solution for this? And um, more often than not, um, us young people, we can probably help, you know, create these kinds of solutions as previously mentioned. And, you know, I hope that in each of our sectors, um, we give this kind of opportunity to the youth, like um, our underemployment rate, I think it was mentioned earlier, is actually, um, it went higher from last year. And I think it's an opportunity to really um, boost up uh, what the youth can contribute in each of our sectors, whether it be government, whether it be in um, civil society or in uh, the private sector, um, we have to give power and we have to listen to the young people. So um, yeah, thank you so much again for everyone. And I hope uh, after this, you can consult even your children or the young people in your own sectors on, you know, how to, how do we want to make the world better? Uh, Tony, 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 may yeah. I add a uh, follow up on what uh, uh, yeah. Keisha just said, no? about listening to the youth. Yeah, I, I, I would encourage you, I've mentioned this to Secretary Dar. I said, Secretary Dar, you have to attract the young people to go into agriculture. You know, agriculture now is high tech. Uh, it's not unlike before the impression of people going into agriculture is low tech, hard, hard work. Now it's high tech. You have drone, you have IOT. You know, we, we can supply so many. If we put our heart to it, you know, we can supply so many things. Uh, just, for, just for you to have some numbers, we import twice what we export. Other countries like Indonesia and Thailand, they export twice what they import. So there's a bit, big upside to that. So the young should really look into the agriculture. Not too much on the high tech. Agri is high tech already. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me just wrap up and then we'll, we'll go to the closing uh, part of the program and just, just a, couple, one more, a couple of minutes. Uh, 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 it's, it's very comforting uh, listening to the report actually that Yemi summarized uh, and then uh, listening to uh, uh, Undersecretary Villon, to uh, Secretary Chua, of course, earlier. Uh, to Dino well to know that technically there's quite a lot of things going on, good things that are going on in in the Philippines. I mean, and 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 in that say in that way we're comforted about about that. And that that came through in both comes through both in the in the report earlier as well as in the in the discussion. But clearly too there's a lot of work to be to be done. I mean and, and I'm, I'm grateful also that our government representative, our private sector our representatives um, uh, and other stakeholders like what Ongi represents and Keisha sees, 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 sees that. I mean, uh, and I think we all agree that uh, inequality, uh, social injustice, uh, you know, as a characteristic of, of the Anthropocene is, is really uh, uh, very important to, to uh, address. No? But uh, just on, from my perspective, working on these issues almost 40 years now, uh, doing this, I have to tell you that this is actually the moment that I have become uh, most uh, hopeful uh, that finally in, in this very bad moment, in this worst uh, sort of manifestations of many of our problems, that finally maybe we, we do know the solutions and, and some of that was, was discussed here. 
that maybe now we we can't afford except to really pay attention uh, to that. I mean, and, and I think that's a really good takeaway from a launch of a human development uh, human development report. I, I, you know, we just had a U.S. inauguration, and uh, those of us who are interested in these things and rituals, we will watch it. And I think all of us would agree that the the most important word spoken there was actually by a young person, uh, uh, you know, not the 78 year old president, but but actually the young person, Amanda Gorman. And I'd like to end uh, uh, this this panel by quoting from her last words in her in her poem, "The Hill We Climb." Uh, she says. The new blue dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. I think the youth presented the case is brave enough to, to be it, and I ask all of us to also be brave enough to do that. Thank you, and I, I, I yield back to Char the, the forum. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavinia. And again, thank you to all of our panels for such an exciting and fruitful discussion. It was very dynamic. We are very happy that, uh, you know, we've we are able to have representatives from across different sectors to provide different insights on how they they were able to understand the new 2020 human development report um, at this point given our limited time we would like to apologize that we were not able to answer all of the questions that you sent via the q a box and via the facebook live comment section in any case we will be collecting the questions that you sent in and we will try our best to get them all answered by our panelists and send them back to you use, using the email addresses that you use to register for this activity. We will be having uh, a, an HDR newsletter, which we will send out to all of the participants of this webinar as well. So to formally close our program, we have a very special message from no other than the Secretary of the Climate Change Commission, Honorable Secretary Emmanuel de Guzman. Here is um, Secretary Manny. I wish to congratulate the United Nations Development Program on the successful launch of the 2020 Human Development Report, or HDR, shifting the focus of development economics from national income accounting to people-centered and nature-based policies, which the HDR expounds on, is both relevant and responsive to our fast-changing environment. The need for this change in mindset has never been more pronounced than it is today, a modern era marked by a pandemic and a climate emergency. To change the perilous path we are on, we need nothing short of a great reset that reforms the ways we've lived and the ways we've regarded our environment. We need to usher a new kind of development the kind that transcends economic capital measures and ensures social economic equity, ecosystem protection, and cultural resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, the HDR calls for a just transformation built around the change mechanisms for social norms and values, incentives and regulation, and nature-based solutions. To achieve this transformation, the HDR has presented an alternative way of measuring human development. Its indicators aim to capture the complex interactions between people and ecosystems and to monitor a nation's progress toward easing planetary pressures and social imbalances. Adding carbon emissions and material footprints in the Adjusted Human Development Index has redefined progress. It tells us that at its core is ensuring the well-being of the people and the planet. This also conveys to all the importance of greater ambition and speed in climate action. We ask our stakeholders, the national government, local government units, private business sector, and civil society to use this gauge for human development and to be mindful always that excessive carbon footprint sets back progress and equality, harms our planet, and endangers human existence. 
for our part in the Climate Change Commission. We assure you that we shall rise to the enormous challenges of societal and sectoral transformation ahead. To bridge the gap between people's belief that it is important to protect the planet and their willingness to take concrete climate actions, we shall accelerate our efforts in raising awareness on practical sustainability solutions, to put in place incentives and regulations that will advance clean energy and a green economy. We have been working closely with Congress and the national government agencies. We shall continue to advocate and advance the full implementation of our climate and environmental laws and policies. To advance nature-based solutions, we have been promoting the integration of ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation strategies into local development planning. We are also pursuing the transformation of our industries and sectors into a low-carbon and green economy through the implementation of our nationally determined contribution. Together, let us care for our common home and build a safer, healthier, fairer, and more sustainable future for the Filipino nation. Thank you. Mabuhay. Now, before we close, we would like to again thank all of our distinguished speakers and panelists and guests for joining us today for the Philippine launch of this very important report. And as we tackle this new age together, let us keep in mind that we have to work together in the, pursu the pursuit of equality, equity, innovation, and stewardship of nature. Through this, we can steer action towards the transformational changes needed to advance human development in the age of humans. We invite everyone to please download the 2020 Human Development Report by accessing the QR code or the link that will be available on your screens right about now. We will also send the recording of the webinar via the and a digital copy of the Human Development Report to your email addresses. So please anticipate that. Once again, this is Charlene. This has been Charlene Balaan of the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines. Maraming salamat po and good afternoon.
Thank you.